Thank you. I never give the same talk twice. So there's a talk called The Frantic Family Syndrome, Stop the Insanity. And my challenge as a public speaker is to come up with a talk that nobody's really ever heard before. And, so, and that's my challenge to me. And so I was sitting in my hotel room this afternoon kind of wondering what I would talk about this evening, just exactly what I would talk about, how I would spin this whole idea of the frantic family to you. And um, what popped into mind was the Ed Sullivan Show. And I started thinking about the plate spinners. Do you remember the plate spinners? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this image came to mind as I was thinking about the contemporary American parent. You, okay? Remember the plate spinners? You'd have it, this guy, and he was usually Hungarian. <laughs> and um, he would take a dowel, and he would get a plate spinning on the dowel, and he would get the dowel balanced, then he'd run to the next, and he'd get the next plate spinning, and he'd get that one up, and he'd run to the next, and he'd get another plate spinning, and he'd get about ten plates spinning. And by the time he got the tenth one spinning, of course, the first one was beginning to wobble like this, and he'd run back to the first one, and he'd start that spinning again, and then he'd get to the second, and... You know, and the audience would break out in this applause. I mean, this guy must have been shooting up cocaine before <laughs> cocaine was even vogue, you know. But. And I was thinking, yeah, this is the analogy. I, I tend to think in terms of analogies. And I think that that analogy is very fitting as applied to the typical concerned parent of today. And we're not going to talk about the unconcerned parents, the ones who prop their feet up and never do anything. We're going to talk about the concerned parents, you. You people who are here tonight because there was something about the title of this that struck a familiar chord and you said, that's me. And you came here this evening to find out about yourself. Well, you're plate spinners. You're running from child to child activity to activity, trying to keep all these plates spinning at the same time. And one of the things that's happening as a result of all this, outside of the obvious, the obvious being you're wearing yourselves to a frazzle, the less obvious thing is that this is really indicative of a very significant change that has taken place in our culture in the last 30 years concerning our attitudes toward children and ourselves and our responsibilities as parents. The change that has taken place, and there's a number of ways of describing it, but one way of describing it is to say that the average American family has shifted from being parent-centered to being child-centered. Whereas it was once understood in the average American family that children were to pay attention to adults. That was the primary direction in which attention flowed in the family. Today, we understand exactly the opposite. If we are enlightened, progressive parents, we understand that it is our job to have attention flow from us to our children. And this understanding that it's our job to pay as much attention as we can, do as much for our children as we can, and get as involved with them as we can is the flint, if you will, of the frantic family syndrome. Each of these plates represents either an activity or a child mm -hmm. that you folks believe you have to keep spinning. You have to keep these plates spinning. If you let one plate fall and shatter, it will be indicative of your overall failure as parents. And you race through the week, and I know this, you see. I know this because I was, at one point in time, enmeshed in this syndrome myself. I tell people I don't ever talk about anything I have not experienced at a personal level. My wife and I were plate spinners at one point in time. We would spin this plate for a while, and then we realized, oh, no, we were neglecting that plate. We'd been spinning this plate too long, and we'd run over to this plate, and we'd spin that plate for a while, and, oh, my gosh, we're not being fair to this plate now, and we'd run over and spin this plate for a while, and, oh, my gosh, why don't you spin that plate, and I'll spin this plate. And, <laughs> and all of this consuming energy driven toward the children, you see, driven toward them. And then 
having worn ourselves out as parents, then we would go to a Friday evening get-together, a Saturday evening get-together with other plate spinners in the community. <laughs> and we would all validate what wonderful parents we were by comparing how exhausted we were. <laughs> oh, listen to what I've been doing from my child. It's just driving me up a wall, but I'm not going to stop. <laughs> and the minute somebody would tell a story of how exhausted they were in the service of their child, somebody else would pipe up with a, well, I'm more exhausted story. <laughs> it seems today that this is how we validate our worth as parents. We exhaust ourselves and then we complain about it and then we go right back and we exhaust ourselves some more. It's very interesting. I was talking to the audience this afternoon. This certainly represents a total shift in parental consciousness, if you will. I'm 47. I was born in 1947. My mother was a single parent for most of the first seven years of my life. I think my parents divorced when I was two or three. We lived in Charleston during those first seven years. My mother went to the College of Charleston full-time. She worked at the post office around on Broad Street part-time when school was in session and full-time when it was not, evenings, weekends, as much as she could. She led an active social life when she was home. She was studying, sewing, cooking, cleaning. She sewed all of our clothes with the exception of undergarments and shoes, even jackets she sewed. She was a very busy woman. And before I tell you this, let me tell you that there was never any other impression in my mind but that I was number one in my mother's heart, that there was no one who occupied a bigger space in her heart than me, that she would be there for me at a moment's notice if I needed her. There was never any question in my mind as to my value in her eyes. And yet, the understanding, and, and by the way, my mother had more time for me. She led an active social life. She had more time for me. But she chose to lead an active social life. And I tell you, I got enough of her time. The understanding in my relationship with my mother, back when I was three, four, five, old enough to look back and remember, can be summed up in three words that she communicated to me, if not in words, at least in attitude. I understood this. They were, leave me alone. <laughs> I was not allowed to be underfoot, as my mother put it. If I got underfoot, which meant unnecessarily around her while she was busy, or even listening to Mozart, which she felt she had a right to do when she had a moment in which to do it, I was not allowed to be underfoot. And my mother had no problem telling me, John Rosemond, you are underfoot. You know exactly how I feel about that. And listen, ladies and gentlemen, she wouldn't scream it. And she wouldn't scream it because she said it right off the bat. She didn't hold it in feeling like it was something she shouldn't say, feeling that saying it was going to destroy my self-esteem. She didn't hold it in for hours, serving me and serving me and serving me, thinking, well, if I serve John one more time, maybe he'll have enough of me and leave me alone. No, because the more you serve, the more the child wants to be served. And the more of a whining, demanding child the child becomes, which is very unfortunate for the child because the child really has no choice in the matter, you see. This is the road that the child's parents are leading him or her down. And the parent won't say, Leave me alone. Because that isn't psychologically correct in 1995. So you hold it in and you hold it in. But there isn't a woman here who does not wish on almost a daily basis that her children would just leave her alone. <laughs> 
But you don't say it. And so you bottle it up inside until it explodes out. And then you feel all together now. And the only way to do penance for the guilt is to serve. <laughs> Keep those plates spinning. <laughs> now my mother said it right off the bat. John Rosemond, you're underfoot, leave me alone. You know how I feel about this. I'm very busy right now, you can see that. You do not need me at all at this moment. You do not need a mother. <laughs> what you need is a mother who is studying for her exam tomorrow, and that is what I am going to do. And in the meantime, my mother believed, weather permitting, children should be out of doors. <laughs> and so she would usher me out of doors. And my mother defined weather permitting very liberally. <laughs> Didn't matter what kind of weather it was, really. That's why she brought me a raincoat, you know. <laughs> Rubber boots. And I'd find myself on the sidewalk with five or six other kids who'd been kicked out of their houses. And we would play. And we were all exiles, and some of you were those exiles. You remember. You remember your mother saying to you, don't come back until lunch. If you come back before lunch, for any reason at all, even to use the bathroom, you are going to be my helper for the rest of the day. You remember these things? And folks, we never questioned, because of this, our mother's love for us. We never questioned her caring. We never questioned her dedication to us. Why do we think in our generation that we must constantly demonstrate to our children something that no previous generation of parents ever felt they had to constantly demonstrate and yet every previous generation of American children seems to have been adequately assured that they were, in fact, loved and wanted. Notwithstanding, two people go to an altar and take a vow to be husband and wife, and I believe that the traditional language still reads forever. And they live in that context within those roles of husband and wife for several years, and then children come along. If you look in on this family, after some time after the second child has come along, you don't really have to wait that long, but we're just going to say the second child for purposes of discussion, you will generally find that these two people are now acting as if they took this vow. I take you to be my husband, and I take you to be my wife, until children do us part. <laughs> Because what happens, you see, and it happened to my wife and myself, I mean, this is in a very uh, significant way a personal testimonial. Somebody came to one of my talks recently and said, John, I'm here to find out all the mistakes I've made as a parent. I said, well, you're going to be disappointed. And they said, why? I said, because I'm going to tell you about all the mistakes I've made as a parent and a husband, and um, you can take away from the evening what relates to yourself. Yeah, what, what happens in many an American family, and I'm talking about your family, is that children are born and suddenly the, the roles of husband and wife assume secondary importance to the roles of mother and father. Typically, and this happens regardless of how many people, of, of which people are working outside the home, whether one or both, Typically, the female parent becomes mother. She sheds the role of wife and becomes mother. The male sheds the role of husband and becomes primary breadwinner, and behind that, father. And I say behind that, and I'll explain that in a moment. The female believes it is now primarily her responsibility to see to it that these children have a proper upbringing. The male believes it is his responsibility to see to the standard of living of this family. And so these two people, they effectively split. One goes off into this area of preoccupation, and one goes off into this area of preoccupation. And 
Yes, I am quite aware that women who are mothers do work outside the home. But it really doesn't make any difference, you see, in the way women have been trained in our generation to think.